Recording. Yeah, recording now. So, I guess we'll start now. So, um, I think we'll skip over the roll call stuff, right? Uh, <laughs> just because this is a demo call. Um, but please do introduce yourself before, like maybe you know, uh, at the beginning of your. Um, I guess when you introduce your project, introduce yourself as well. That'd be that'd be ideal. So, if you have anyone to uh, to, you know, to to basically shout out or. If they've done really cool things, uh, helped you out in a way, maybe your mentor, whomever it is, uh, please shout out Friends of Mozilla. Some line uh, 83. So this unfortunately very quiet, so I'm going to put Abby here. Yeah. But anyone else, please do um, um, shout out. Thanks, man. <laughs> it's very quiet. Oh. Okay, your mentor, okay. Very nice. For organizing everything. Ah, okay. And you have Dave Bill for giving thoughtful feedback. Great job, uh, Dave. He likes Sydney. pizza if you want to thank him. Oh, yeah, okay. <laughs> this is almost like yeah, it's connected. So, <laughs> tactical, yeah, question answering. So Sydney of, and Abby and Megan uh, for continuous feedback and inspiration. So great job. And it looks like it's getting quiet. Okay, cool. <laughs> so um, we'll move on to the project updates. So the first project uh, to present will be um, Squarebox. Sorry? Min, can you take a bit of time explaining Mozilla Open Leaders in that section up at the top? Sorry. Ah, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Kind, of, kind of rushing in, yeah. <laughs> Cool. So the uh, Mozilla Open Leadership Training is basically a program to help encourage and you know fuel the internet health movement uh, to try and get uh, I guess projects into the open, uh, train people up to produce uh, to help produce more open projects and uh, and also support each other uh, in the process of doing so. So um, all these projects uh, which will be demoed today um, will accept your contributions. You know you can find them. Uh, I guess. The links um, in each uh, in each section. Uh, sorry, in each uh, section below on 9, 90, 95 onwards. And uh, yeah, so uh, all these projects need help, and your help is appreciated. So if you're joining us, um, you know, as part of the wider audience, please do take a look. Um, and uh, each project should have their you know guides and readmes, and you can figure out uh, what they're looking for. Um, the applications are open for the next round of the Open Leadership Program, and the link's on line 68, so if you take a look at the, uh, the blog post, um, you should be able to find out what the program's about, how to apply for it, and uh, yeah, that's really appreciated if you have a project uh, that you can, uh, uh, well, potentially could uh, uh, go through with the uh, Open Leadership Program. Um, application help um, is available on the link on line 69, and that's basically to, I guess, if you're stuck or if you need more info on how to actually participate or whether you should participate or not, just, just drop in um, some text in that, in that etherpad. Cool. Is that good, Abby? Thanks for doing that, man. <laughs> no worries. Okay, so, uh, okay, cool. So we're going to move on to Squadbox. Uh, that's with Caitlin. Uh, so, Caitlin, um, feel free to kick it off. And please introduce yourself before uh, you start introducing the project. Okay. Hi, everyone. My name is Caitlin. Um, I recently graduated from MIT, which is where Squadbox started. Uh, and now I live in New York City, and I'm a software engineer. Um, so Squadbox is a tool to help people who are experiencing online harassment by having their friends be moderators for their messages. Um, so we use a system of filters based on like the message content and who send it, sent it and that sort of thing to determine if a message needs to go through moderation. If it does, your friends see it first and then they can like approve or reject it based on uh, what instructions you give them for messages that you consider to be harassment. Um, and it currently works for email. We're working on building integrations to other platforms. So some recent updates, uh, we made a blog and we've written a couple of posts, one just about the project in general, and then a second one about uh, 
the experience we had at most fast and the session we led and sort of what takeaways we had from that. Um, so there's a link if you want to check it out. Um, and we also got to connect with a lot of people at MoSFest who were interested in the pro project and the sort of space in general. Um, so that was pretty cool. And we now have like a mailing list and like we've had a couple of people comment on our GitHub issues and that sort of thing. So hopefully we've, we're closer to having like a, you know, active community of contributors. Um, also, there's someone who's still at MIT who we are collaborating with who has made sort of a technical improvement to the project. Um, initially, we were using like the Gmail API, but now she's gotten it working to use IMAP instead of that API. So that's like a nice technical step forward. Um, and I guess that's pretty much it for updates from like the last month. Um, but I threw in a bunch of links there with our website and um, where you can try out the tool or read more about it. Um, GitHub repository where more info about sort of our next step plans and uh, what we want to accomplish. And then uh, ways to follow what's going on with the project, Twitter, blog, mailing list. Um, and in terms of getting help from other people, we're looking for people to contribute, not just like technically coding wise, but also um, I think there's a lot of work to be done gathering resources for people who experience harassment um, or their, and as well as like their friends who are moderating for them. Um, so people who are interested in that could contribute in that way. Also just like if you have any ideas for like how the tool could be better or like ways that you could filter out messages that look like they might be harassing or anything like that. Uh, we would love to hear those. Um, and then also just like sharing it with your networks or anyone that you know who might be interested. Um, okay, I see you have a question. How do we test it out? So if you go to squadbox.org, which I've linked, there should be like a try it out button. Um, and that will help you like walk through the process of setting it up. Um, and if you have problems with that, feel free to like reach out to me via email or GitHub or whatever, um, and we can talk about it. Great. Um, cool. cool. So I think there are. Oh, there's another question coming in. I think. Oh no, this is. Uh, I guess. Uh, <laughs> Sorry, I just wanted to say it was it's awesome. <laughs> Thanks. Cool. Um, so, uh, I guess what's the main call to action? Let's say go to squadbox.org. Yeah, that right. will direct you to mm -hmm. like everything else, and yeah. So, thanks so much to everyone for helpful feedback throughout this and connecting us with people. And I don't know if you look at our Git. Thought it looked at our Git repository before. Uh, open leaders and after I think it's like an amazing difference in terms of like how accessible it is and like easy to understand and like uh, I don't know Openness to contributors and that sort of thing. So I'm super appreciative of that outcome of open leaders Brilliant nice work Cool, so <clears throat> um, Next up is privacy board game with Gerardo uh, Once again, please introduce yourself first then your project? Yeah, hey, it's me. <laughs> uh, Private board gaming, it's our, our open offline extensive board game for teaching and learning VC and the security best practices. Um, for the next, for last past year, we, we've made the, our website, it's ready now. Uh, it's a hot site for now, but in the next year we will improve it. Um, we put some uh, new string to our project, yeah, uh, and everyone can help us translate this. Uh, we have a, a new platform, a new partner platform to to translate it to, in a way more easily. Um, facilitator resources are really available now with tips on how to organize the gameplay in your local community like schools, projects, hacker spaces, uh, or universities. Um, and some bugs on the private board game is fixed now, on the board game specifically. 
thanks for for the issues contributors thanks um new as contributors are joining like today <laughs> Uh, now to help be helping us translate the, the game. Uh, everyone is welcome. The Esperanto and French are coming up. Uh, we've made the connections to partners to test the, the board game, uh, like universities, one university, one schools, uh, two web terrorist projects, a hacker space in my city. Uh, we will run some uh, sessions of the private board game. The, this month in next month next year uh, uh, everyone can help us uh, translate the board gaming into your language uh, don't need software or tech skills just need to go to po editor website platform uh, select your language login and start translate the streams um, you can uh, report in bugs suggesting enhancements or new ideas uh, check your contributing to, to get guidance. Um, let me check the questions here. Mm -hmm. Write down your, your questions here. Mm -hmm. so the main no. Of is, uh, well, I guess translation of your, of your board game? Mm, sorry? Like, so the main call to action is translation of the uh, of the text in your in, in the board game, right? Mm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. Uh, have you done any work mastering if people's attitudes around the privacy change after the playing the game? Uh, we will test it, but now we are not mastering it. Sorry, but uh, now enjoying it with the some uh, web literacy projects. People are involved in, in a long-term project. We can mentor it only if a project inside a long term. Uh, by short term, not only only a only a uh, session on a hacker space. We can can mentor it just on long term. We will do it now in a web literacy project yeah. this year and next year. Uh, I tried to capture your answer there. Uh, mm -hmm. Feel free to fix it if I got that wrong, Geraldo. Uh, sorry, I don't get. Sorry. No, it's okay. It's okay. <laughs> okay. There's a lot going on in your set. Yeah, I yeah. um I wrote down your answer, I think. In yeah. the Etherpad? Yeah, I think that's what you said, but feel free to change it if I got it wrong. But you got a really nice promo website, Geraldo. That looks great. You're getting some yeah, love. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Did you make it? Uh, no, uh, okay. it, it, it's it's a remix, but uh, some contributors from October Fest have the uh, helped us. But the graduates uh, have made for me. <laughs> I love graduates. <laughs> <laughs> Green so nice, yeah. Really and you have uh, trends of fixes as water. Nice, great, cool. Uh, so I guess there are no more questions, right? Yeah, people uh, can keep adding questions. Yeah, so we'll get back to it. Uh, we'll, we'll, I guess we'll do a quick skim over at the end just to make sure we haven't missed any, uh, uh, just, to, just to make sure we haven't missed any questions. So, cool. Oh yeah, how do we play the game? That's a good question. Gerardo? The Smooth website actually has a button. Oh yeah. <laughs> if you click on the link on 130, there's oh, a yeah. play now, it's open button and it will take you right there. To GitHub, nice. Yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah, it looks oh, like Geraldo cool. is frozen. <laughs> yeah, he's yeah. Like, he is freezing here. Sorry, Geraldo. Um, but it's pretty nice. I it's think you nice, did yeah. great work, Geraldo. I think he can hear us, right? <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> I hope so. Yeah. Either way, it's recorded, so he can. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay. Cool. So next up, we have Influence Texas. Uh, that's Amy and Gilbert. Uh, I'm not sure if they're both on the call, uh, but yeah, Influence Texas. Hi, I'm here. I think Gilbert's there too. Um, cool. Yeah, let me try to do a screen share and see how successful I am with that. 
right. Um, can you all see my screen at all? No? Not yet. Um, you can? Not yet. Not yet? OK. Not yet. What I'll do is I'll just talk about it. And the, the links are there. So if you want to click through the links while I talk about them, then um, you can do that. Um, so yeah, what we started out doing is um, trying to put campaign finance records and voting records together for folks. And um, we started this at a hackathon in June. We've been working on it since then. And what we learned at MissInfoCon and MozFest is that there are really no other groups doing what we're doing, which I was kind of surprised about, but it's not very easy to do, it turns out. So that could be why. Um, so we've worked through openstates.org to uh, improve their vote scraper so that we have um, we are getting uh, the votes from the legislature imported into our, um, our back end framework. And we don't have the front end yet, but we're working on that. And um, so that's getting better. And then we found out what the deal is with the campaign finance records that they're so complex that it's really hard to do. So we found a nonprofit partner in Austin called Texans, Texans for Public Justice that's gonna help us out. And um, what we are in the process of needing to do is become like a hybrid organization where we have some type of a legal entity that we can merge with our open source project because we need to sign a non-disclosure with them to be able to use their proprietary database for the campaign finance information which they're willing to give us in a charge so um, it's kind of an interesting thing that we're doing so if anyone has any expertise and being like a hybrid open source project then please let us know um, how best to do that it's a great relationship we have with our nonprofit partner but they've worked for 12-ish years to build this database that we could never do. Um, so um, it's exciting that we're getting to the point where I think we're gonna have like a forward-facing project in the next few months. We've got new developers coming on board and um, our GitHub repo is looking good. We've got um, some great labels there so people can easily go to it and look for beginner friendly or help wanted and find places where they can contribute. And Gilbert is our data scientist who will be working more with like the voting records and the actual bills to try to figure out what does this bill do by using NLP and some other methodologies, which Gilbert can hop in and explain that if he wants to. Um, so yeah, we're, we're moving along and we're excited about it. Um, it's not an easy thing to do, but um, yeah, creating an API from a database that someone has developed over 12 years, that's no documentation, it's not a small task, but we have awesome people who are doing it. So. Yeah, please feel free to check out our stuff and um, offer feedback on anything that doesn't make sense or isn't clear. It'd be great. That's uh, great work. Uh, you have uh, some comments, you know, keep up the awesome work. You know, people, yeah, it looks really good, actually. Really good. It seems like a, a, nice, uh, a nice project setting up the boundary of what is open, what is closed, which is you know, arguably a very interesting spot. Yeah. I'm not quite sure what parts need to be closed. I'd say that no project is 100% open. Yeah, that's interesting. I don't, yeah, I'm not really sure. I know that there are some companies that have a proprietary product, but then they have like a community where people can build and add on and create things that are not there for them. So I know that there are entities out there who are doing sort of open and not open. But yeah, we don't have the option right now of opening the database that we don't own. So it's kind of trying to integrate that and figure out what that looks like. Um, I guess it'd be kind of difficult doing derivative works, right, with this type of licensing. I'm sorry? Uh, derivative works, so I guess content based off closed content, which is kind of maybe that could be an issue. Um, so yeah, it's weird because the, the public records are all available in Texas, mm -hmm. but the way they put them out, they're too messy to figure out how to use. So right. it's sort of weird because the, the data is free and open mm. to public. It's just the, the mechanism these people have devised to be able to sort through that data to make it actually useful is mm -hmm. um, the part that they own, so. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Yeah, well, I'd say um, I'm so glad you're working on this. And just, yeah, I like how you're thinking about how to bring openness to this like closed partnership or like tenuous partnership even. Um, just because I think like all openness is sort of on a gradient and no one runs a project that's completely open where like absolutely everyone has equal say in what's going on. There's always a little bit of, um, yeah, a little bit of something where it's like top down. Um, so just uh, moving as far as you can on the open scale, I think keep doing it. Let Thanks. us know how we can support you to do that because I know it can be really tricky when you're working with partners. Yeah. 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 
Thanks. Brilliant work. <laughs> cool. So next up, we have NYC Open Data Week. Um, Adrienne? You in the call? Hmm, let's do a quick check. Maybe hey, she's on the phone, so you have to unmute her. Yeah. Okay. There we go. There you go. Yeah. Yes, we can hear you. Great. Okay. Awesome. Um, I had a deck that I could just walk people through if screen sharing works. Mm -hmm. um, and if not, I'll just talk through um, what we're up to. I am sharing my screen, and I will. Oops. What line is the deck on? Is the 183? Yep, that works. Okay, and uh, let's see if I can get into presentation mode. Still loading. No problem. <laughs> no, I've clicked present. I think I might be sharing the wrong screen. I'll reshare. <laughs> and this one. Okay. I'm sharing the front, the first one, I think. Can you see it, Min? Yep. Okay. I can see it. <laughs> okay. Well, yeah, and I can keep um, it. Abby, do you just want me to tell you when to switch slides or? Yes, that would be helpful. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, hi, everybody. Um, I, I think most of you have probably heard this before, but for folks who are new on the call, I'll just go through a bit of the shtick. Um, uh, let's see, you can go to the next slide. Thanks, Abby. So I'm Adrian Schmoker. I'm the Director of Civic Engagement and Strategy at the New York City Mayor's Office of Data Analytics. And my project as a part of the Mozilla Open Leadership Program has been uh, planning Open Data Week 2018, looking to make it more open. So a little bit of background about open data. You can go to the next slide. So for those of you who aren't familiar with New York City, we're a city in the United States. Uh, we're kind of big, few people know about us. Uh, we have 8.5 million people who live, work, and play here. And these are the people that we're thinking about day in and day out and figuring out how to serve better. Um, Abby, you can just slowly go through the next few slides that works. So these are just some of the services that New York City provides, as I'm sure a lot of you in where you live provide picking up trash, maintaining street trees, uh, we have 311 as a service people can call into, text into. Um, I made a noise complaint this morning, uh, snow plowing. Um, and this is all, so these are all city services and operations, and we're collecting more and more data on those operations um, as time goes by. So becoming a smarter and smarter city. And as we collect more and more of that data, you can go on to the next slide. Uh, we're making it available to the public. So that's what New York City Open Data is. Um, if you go to the next slide, uh, what's unique in New York City is that we have a law that powers our program. So in a lot of places, it's an executive order um, or just a program that a specific team is managing. But in New York City, it's powered by law, um, which is relatively unique in the United States, uh, more common in Europe. Um, if you go to the next slide, uh, beyond just having a law, we also have kind of the vision of New York City's open data program is that is we, we call it open data for all, is that this is um, your city, open data belongs to you, and we're looking more and more to put this back in the hands of New Yorkers. If you go to the next slide, um, this is just a quick, uh, and you can just flip through the next few, this is just a quick, for people who aren't familiar with open data, um, this is what it looks like on our website. Um, you have different like search result-like things. If you click on it, you eventually get to um, uh, literal tabular data that's available online. So you don't have to have any specific software, you just have to have a computer, internet connection, and browser, and you can access this data. Um, if you go to the next slide, you can see what the, the tabular, yeah, exactly. So that's an example of some New York City open data. We have close to 2,000 different assets, and we see an average of about 20,000 users to the site per week right now. Um, and if you go to the next slide, and I promise this is getting into Open Data Week, but just like to give a little bit of background and context. Um, so this is what we know about um, the New Yorkers and you know folks beyond New York who use open data right now. Um, this is from our annual report that came out last July. Um, and if you go to the next slide, uh, we think we can do better because we know that open data is all around us. Like open data really relates to everyone. As long as you're using your city, you are interacting with open data, right? Um, sidewalks, subways, taxi cabs, restaurants. Um, as long as you enter a building, there's like data about buildings, right? 
Um, so if you go to the next slide, this is where Open Data Week comes in, is, you know, civic engagement is a part of my job. Um, it's literally a part of my title. Um, I was hired to figure out how we can get more New Yorkers to engage with open data. If you go to the next slide, Open Data Week is about the top part of this engagement funnel. Like, how do we continue to raise awareness about open data? So if you go to the next slide, the reason why open data is a week is March has two serendipitous dates. Uh, there's International Open Data Day, which happens um, uh, this uh, in 2018. It'll be March 3rd. And then March 7th is the anniversary of New York City's open data law, which I just told you a little bit about. Um, so we did Open Data Week, if you go to the next slide, for the first time in 2017 to celebrate the five-year anniversary of the open data law. Um, we pulled it together over the course of five weeks. Um, it was um, a partner of mine in the community who does a lot of civic tech work just told me, you're thinking of doing a few events already. Why not just make a week out of it? And I was like, you know what? That's a great idea. Let's make it happen. So over the course of five weeks, I literally just emailed a few people and said, hey, like, do you think you'd be interested in tying your event into open data, doing something with open data? And we had 12 events, 900 New Yorkers engaged across three boroughs. And if you go to the next slide, these were some of the goals for doing it again was, okay, well, rather than me just tapping a few people on the shoulder, like, how do I make this a more open process? Like, how do I get more people to participate in organizing um, Open Data Week this time around? Um, looking to double the amount of people who are participating in this engagement, um, number of people who actually participate in Open Data Week, making sure we reach all five rows, not just three. Um, and using this as an opportunity to launch new products and programs um, as a part of the open data team. So if you go to the next slide, this is um, kind of what we've accomplished uh, so far. So we had a little bit of press announcing that Open Data Week was happening. Uh, we launched the open call for participation in late October. You can actually see the submission form at that bit.ly link. It's just a Google form and have done a bit of outreach um, over the last few weeks. Uh, submissions close next Friday, which is really exciting, but we already have some people who um, have submitted ideas, which we're really excited about. Um, and I just want to take the opportunity to thank um, the folks at the Mozilla Open Leadership Program. Um, I learned a lot over the course of the last few months, um, and it's just been really helpful to have this program to help organize my thinking as someone who's you know, taking five weeks to do this and to taking five months to do this and just kind of having the bandwidth to have more time, but also to have more brains has really, um, I think, made a really big difference. Um, and the last slide just has some, like my email address and some key links, but that's also in the uh, Etherpad. So um, that's, that's it for my demo. Thank you guys so much. Thanks, Adrian. Great work. This is Really, really interesting. I can't see the, my screen anymore, so let me just <laughs> figure out. Okay, okay, cool. So great work. Um, so uh, how could? So I guess we could, you know, maybe spread the word. You know, tweet with those with the hashtags on line one hundred eighty nine. Is that right? Yes. Yeah. yeah. So um, in terms of ways to participate. Um, you know, if you're in New York, you're welcome to be an organizer. If you're not in New York, I'm open to creative ideas on how you could participate in Open Data Week as well. Um, definitely looking for more people to participate. So um, would love some Twitter love. There's like some copy in line, as Min said, 189, um, that you can just plop into a tweet. Um, it should fit. Um, and then if you're in New York City, you should come and attend an Open Data Week event. Uh, we should have the website with all of the different events up by January 25th. So I'll make sure to try to find a way to um, let folks uh, in the cohort know when that's up so that you can participate if you'd like. Hmm, so I guess you're looking for people to come, maybe come and participate then, right? Potentially. Yes, definitely. Oh, come on. <laughs> come yeah. join us in New York. And we have a comment, I think, or a question from Maria. So Wikimedia has a project that focuses on structured open data, which focuses on knowledge, connecting knowledge and education content. I wonder if there are some ways in which you can connect or collaborate. So Maria is asking if you want to, if you want to collaborate, I suppose. Yes, would love to. Cool. So, um, I, I think there's someone else um, from Wikimedia, maybe in this cohort or another one that I've been meaning to connect with as well. So yes, to all the connections, that'd be great. Cool. So there's a, I'll just copy your email address and 
Well, that's not really, actually that is really modular. So, okay, let's pop that down here. Is that right? Looks good, I think. Um, please correct uh, correct anything if it's wrong. Um, cool. Also, Adrian, I realized halfway through that you probably could have shared your own screen. I, so, thanks for letting me be your slide. <laughs> <laughs> no worries. No worries. It works. Leveling up. <laughs> thanks so much for slide guiding it along. <laughs> I was like, oh, she's on the phone. She can't do it. I'm like, wait a minute. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. <laughs> it worked great. Thank you so much. No cool. Great work. So now, next up, we have uh, Connect on Meta Wicked Media by Maria. So Maria, would you mind kicking off? Yeah. Hi, can Great. you hear me? Yep, perfect. Okay, so I'm going to try and share my screen because mm -hmm. I prepared a few slides just to organize this. Mm -hmm. um, so can you guys see my screen? Yeah, but it's not full screen. It's uh, just the, uh, the browser view. Okay, great. I think it's doing something. Okay. Yeah, cool. okay, great. Uh, so my project was uh, is focusing on these two questions. How do you open an existing network to others? And how do you encourage experienced users to offer support? And as you can see, these questions are actually uh, connected. Uh, because uh, as soon as you open a network, you're showing who, who in that uh, group uh, has skills that uh, could support you. Um, so that is what uh, Connect on Meta Wikimedia is about. Uh, it's a platform designed to connect uh, with others and to find peer-to-peer -peer support. Um, I, I wanted to go over a few things that uh, I uh, achieved during this program. The first of them was uh, GitHub. Uh, I learned how to use uh, GitHub and in the process, I, I also gained a better understanding of how to request uh, technical tasks and set expectations for collaboration. And that was uh, pretty, pretty cool. I, it felt very empowering. Uh, this is what the project looks like uh, at the moment uh, on GitHub. Mm -hmm. um, it has a, a description, a background, and a few milestones uh, for people to engage. Um, next up is uh, personas and pathways. Uh, this step was uh, very important. I created three uh, the personas and pathways for three out of the four groups that uh, this project is targeting. And this also allowed me to create a network and offer this platform as a service for other projects uh, and teams. Uh, one example of that is that I'm uh, trying to start working with uh, Rachel Farron, who is also in this cohort, um, uh, to see if this can uh, support her work with volunteer developers and how they can better connect after events. Um, I created an engagement plan uh, for Connect on uh, Meta Wikimedia, uh, which includes uh, using my current network to expand reach. Um, so the engagement plan consisted on identifying highly active uh, groups, uh, creating a group for them and showing how they can use it themselves and hoping that they would sign up for it. And I tried this with two different groups, as you can see now. Uh, this is what the, the platform looks like right now. It's a prototype. Um, so I tried this with two different groups. Uh, one was the Wikimedia Diversity Group. I created the group and I, I reached out to them on Facebook and I said, hey, I created this group and everyone was uh, really excited and all of these people signed up to participate. Um, and I think this was uh, correlated with the fact that I did this right after a conference that brought all of them together. So um, it, it worked really well because they were already looking forward to working together. When I tried that with another group, for example, the Volunteer Supporters Network, it didn't work well <laughs> and nobody signed up. Um, and later on, I actually found that um, they already had their own page on Meta Wikimedia, as you can see uh, here. It's the same principle. It has uh, some icon identifying, there's a description, and there's a list of people who are working on this topic. Uh, so I still have to explore um, a bit more how um, the features work and how to get people engaged who are already maybe doing this somewhere else. And 
finally, oh, next steps. Uh, I, we, uh, our team has recently been approved to um, hire a technical design contractor the, to help us um, develop the, uh, the platform a little bit forward because at the, whoops, sorry. Um, at the moment, uh, Connect, to create a, a group on Connect, you have to do the following. You have to go here and read some documentation and copy some markup and create the, the page. Uh, in the future, we will have some things more similar um, to, for example, what we have for people to contribute a resource uh, on the Wikimedia Resource Center. And just to show what that looks like as something like this, add a resource. Hopefully creating a group will be as easy as what it is now to add a resource. Um, yeah, so uh, I, I hope I didn't go too fast. <laughs> Uh, I have my contact info here, and I added a few. I, at the moment, I'm collecting feedback from from people on uh, what um, comments and questions you have about how do you connect online with others and to collaborate, uh, and what features specifically make you feel more engaged. Uh, I'm, I'm interested in learning about this. Um, yeah, and that's it. So thanks. Thanks, Maria. Uh, let's take a look at the uh, etherpad. I can't get back to my screen now. <laughs> uh, is it the same for you, Abby? Um, I'm fine. You're fine? Did okay, you cool. Oh, there you go. Okay, cool. <laughs> so it looks like you have uh, a few comments. I was in the middle of writing. <laughs> uh, all right, so like, please, yeah. So a connector uh, opportunity, connection. So that's with uh, oh, yeah. Adrian. So that's uh, 218, oh, cool. yeah. yeah. Cool. Cool. It's really, yeah, it's really good. Really good. It's actually interesting to see how, um, you know, two, two groups perform differently. So good work. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> and uh, specialized knowledge. Yeah. So that makes sense. Okay, cool. So good luck with the uh, technical implementation. Hope it goes well. Uh, and maybe it'd be cool to see some metrics, right? See how, how it performs. <laughs> um, cool. So, okay, so I guess your call to action is, uh, well, any ideas on how to improve the, uh, the platform and uh, collaboration? Yeah, yeah exactly. Uh, mm -hmm. Ideas on, on how to improve the platform. And if you, if you feel like sharing your own experience on, on other platforms that, that have worked for you, I would love to, to hear about those, specifically on when it comes to uh, user experience and, um, and working online, basically. Great. Uh, thanks, Maria. Yeah, thank so, you. So, no worries. Next up, we have community event platform. Uh, Maria, are you, would you uh, mind starting? Yeah, do you hear me? Yeah, perfect. Okay, so um, the name of the, of the project is community event platform. The idea is to have a web application for some tasks related to event organization, like sending um, invitations, creating uh, certificates of, of participation. And so uh, I'm gonna share my screen and to show um, a basic web app that, that I finished. And uh, do you see my screen? Mm -hmm. Yep, we can see it. There's a um, a window, I think, in the uh, middle of the. Uh, okay. Hmm. There's like a white window, uh, well, shade thing in the middle. Oh, wait a minute. Okay. Okay. So. Um, the idea of the, of the web app is to have a, an application that helps doing some, some tasks. Uh, I mean, for example, if, uh, when the events that I've organized before, 
we usually edit manually these um, these documents to generate um, certifications to to generate invitations and then send it to to emails to speakers. So um, well, the the front end part is still uh, not ready, but uh, the idea is here um, we capture data from from the speakers, and then we can generate um, those documents for them. So here there, there is a list of the speakers that you already um, register on the on the web app. Then you select one of them. Uh, I just um, register one just for 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 the demo and. Then, um, after generating the the certificate, uh, the user has the option to to download the the document. And for the invitation, uh, it has the same option option to select uh, the speakers that that the user needs to send invitation. So. After generating the the file, uh, it gives the user these two options: the option to to download the document and then to send it to email. If I check um, this option and then click on on the bottom, it will receive an email like this. The text and also the image is um, on a on an HTML document, and it it sends this text to email and the file that contains the the invitation. So these are the the, the features that will be available to the to the web app and. Uh, I will need help in the GUI design and also with the improvement of the code. I'm developing this application with Python and using the micro framework Flask. And also, any ideas and suggestions are welcome. Great. Cool. So let's just see. Hmm. I have to get back to my etherpad. Okay. So looks like you have a few comments. What framework? Okay. So yeah, what framework are you using for the uh, for the front end? Ah, yeah. Um, I will show you. Uh, is this one? You like it? Cool. Yeah. And you have a, okay, what's this? Branding, proposal UI draft, okay. And so generally it's quite positive, yeah. Nice contribution, very slick, like the, okay. Uh, any plan to push the code to GitHub? Yeah, the code, is, mm -hmm. uh, the code is already yeah, on GitHub. Mm -hmm. Great. So I guess the general ask is, uh, well, code, no, improving code, so con uh, code contributions, uh, UI redesign, UX. And templates, ideas, yeah. suggestions. Cool, I'll take a look. Great work, Mariel. This is some pretty Thanks. sweet, um, I'm just looking at Geraldo's stuff too. Mm -hmm. some pretty sweet contributions. Are you gonna incorporate that, Mario? I'm oh, sorry, that's pretty on the spot. Are you gonna review it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, I'm gonna review uh, what Geraldo says, but okay. I'm also planning to include Okay. Thanks. Yeah. It's almost like live uh, live testing of the uh, of the cohort stuff, right? <laughs> cool. Well, yeah, and so, I'm glad you got your stuff on GitHub. I know that was uh, yeah, it was taking a while. So, yeah, good job. 
great way. Cool. So next up, we have um, pre and post event engagement with Rachel. Hi, can you hear me? Yep, a bit quiet, but yeah. Okay, uh, I'll try to get a little closer to the mic. Okay. Um, okay, so um, my project is pre and post event engagement. Um, I've spent the last month interviewing event and conference managers from um, big community driven and open conferences from around the world. Um, I'll probably end up this project with about 20 interviews. Um, some of the people that I've interviewed were um, the organizers of Aspiration Tech, Allied Media Conference, the Wikimedia Conference, Harmful Speech Online, SourceCon, Mozilla Fest, Mozilla Open Leaders Program, thank you, Abby, um, Diversity Conference, Wikimedia Conference India, Debian Conference, Strange Loop, Open Conference, Google Code in Google, Summer of Code, Nonprofit Technology Conference, FOSS Asia, Wikimedia Hackathon 2017, Wiki and Daba, Wiki Amrite University Hackathon, and Wikidata Conference. Um, there's a couple more people that I'm still potentially going to interview or not, and we're working that out, but we'll see. 20 interviews um, uh, was really fun to do. Uh, I spent an hour talking to each person, except for a couple people who we got really excited about the topic and kept extending the time. Um, so this resource um, originally was meant to be just about pre and post event engagement, um, but over time the project got expanded to quite a few um, more areas, which I'll go over in a minute. Um, and that was because since I was already talking to these people and it's unlikely that anyone's going to do 25 hour long interviews anytime soon with all these people again, I, I thought that it would probably be valuable to um, spread out the questioning and the knowledge that would be gained from this project. Um, this is not a step-by-step -step how to organize events, which is something that we kind of already have. It's linked um, in the links below on the Etherpad, the Just Hackathons handbook that we have. Um, but this is more of a place to get inspired, to go and see what other people are working on um, and see what they're doing and then build your own program because most of these things um, have to be customized based on your own community, your own event, and your own organizing team. Um, right now I'm in the process of sorting through about uh, like 90 pages of data, um, getting it down into a small amount of data, um, and then putting it into um, useful sections and information in a really readable way. So the main topics that have come out of this project are safe spaces, which is codes of conduct, participant guidelines, inclusion, and event safety. Um, then we have pre-event engagement, which is encouraging participant um, encouraging their excitement, their planning, and their participation before the event starts. Um, then there's basically the communication side of it. How are you communicating with your participants and how are they communicating with each other? Because that's usually a lot more complicated than just we email them. Um, then there's co-creating events. So it's basically how can you organize an event that empowers your attendees to feel like it's there their event too, um, then if everyone's working on making a good event, then the, the whole event's going to be better. It doesn't just have to be organizers making an event for what they think people want. Um, then there's the whole measuring success side of things, which sounds uh, simple, but it's not. Usually event organizers can go to an event and say, hey, people were happy and smiling and it was great. Uh, but the problem is if you're talking to funders or people who weren't there, you can't just say that. You actually have to have measurements to show. So I found a lot of interesting things about that. Uh, then we have event follow-up. So it's basically like if you want your event to have impact, um, you come away with action items. So this is basically um, efforts that are supporting um, participants and speakers to follow up on action items from the event. Uh, then we have the post-event engagement side of things which is a little bit different than the follow-up. It's just more like using your event as a springboard or a catalyst just to encourage more participation in your community. Um, then we had the mentoring program side of things, um, which is a huge topic, but we tried to get into some specifics. Um, and then there's newcomer support, which is really important. How do you make your newcomers feel welcome, feel like they don't have to sit at a table eating lunch alone, feel like they have something to do starting from the first minute they, they walk into the door? Um, so I know that this is a huge tease because if you go to the page right now, um, all of those sections are still blank. But I promise you that um, there's a lot of work happening behind the scenes. Um, things should be published on the link within two weeks from now, maybe three at the most, but I'm 
trying to set a two week, uh, week deadline. And I would just say um, that this project has been really interesting. I've spent the last years thinking in depth about um, all of these things. I in some naive way, almost considered myself to be an, an event expert because I've been organizing so many events for so long on so many different scales of size. Um, and just the things that I've learned and the new ideas that I, um, that have come from this, these interviews has been really humbling um, and really amazing. So, um, I just want to thank the Mozilla Open Leaders Program for this because I don't think this project would have gotten as much attention as it has um, or had grown into so many topics um, without the Mozilla Open Leaders Program. And I also want to say thank you to Maria from Wikimedia Foundation for being such a good partner throughout this. We really worked on this together. And then, of course, to Min and Abby for being great program leads. So thank you very much. Let me know if you have questions. Excellent work. I'm really excited to see what, you know, um, those sections being filled out and maybe even use it, you know, that'd be great. Uh, lots of valuable information there, so really looking forward to it. Um, also, that's a really, really long list of events. That's a really, that's really impressive. So, like, there's, there must be some, you know, gems hidden in that, uh, in that data, right? Um, what else? Great yeah, absolutely. Cool. And I think some people, I think it's Adrian, maybe some, yeah, I think Adrian's setting up a time to chat and yeah. Um, so maybe a timeline on maybe, um, when this stuff will be online. Are you aiming for like Christmas ish? Uh, it should be online two weeks from now. That's what I'm aiming on. Mm -hmm. Um, because a lot, so many people spent so much time talking to me that I feel a definite, um, obligation to make sure that they get something back. Um, I, yeah, so I, I'm trying to get it up as soon as possible. And Great. Looking forward to it. Uh, thanks, Rachel. So next up we have the, what, Popper with Evo, Sina, uh, and a few others. Pete. Okay, cool. Yeah. Um, let me share my screen. Uh, Um, so I have a couple of slides just to introduce the project. Uh, can you see my slides? Yep. All right. Um, so this is, uh, work that we had already started before we, uh, joined the program, but, uh, we wanted to make it, uh, just improve the open aspects of it. And the goal of the popper experimentation protocol and the CLI tool is just to make it easier to, um, generate for, for practitioners to generate uh, experiment uh, scientific explorations and scientific uh, pipelines that are easier to re-execute re uh, and just to quickly uh, motivate what why we think we need a, a protocol like this uh, just think about this scenario which I know many of you have gone through which is when you're reading a paper or you're reading documentation of a software project and, or just in general anything that involves executing stuff um, you come up with some questions that might not be necessarily answered by just reading the article things like simple things like what how were things compile how were things configured and then maybe even asking what if the what if type of questions like I wonder what would happen if I did this or I wonder what would happen if I changed this um, and all these questions are really hard to answer because we don't we don't follow common practices uh, and we that are that are uh, common in other domains of uh, empirical research. Uh, basically, we don't have a lab notebook, right? A lab notebook, which is a written record of what was wrong, why, um, and this is very common in other domains of uh, of empirical sciences. And if you used a, a, a version control system before, you could think of a repository, uh, kind of like a, the commit log of a repository as the lab notebook. Uh, the problem is by just that just by putting everything on version control doesn't make it uh, repeatable automatically. So in this project, what we try to do is kind of like systematically think about how would you go about organizing the contents of the repo. Uh, that that is associated to an article or a tech report. 
Um, so this is kind of like the a pipeline, experimentation pipeline that we, a lot of people go through. Uh, we all write code. We all set up environments. We all use input data sometimes and generate output, analyze results, and write and report results in the form of manuscript. So if we, if we compare this with what people do in, in software engineering, uh, the software engineering world, in the DevOps world, and we overlay that on top of this view, um, then we kind of see that there's a lot of tooling out there that we could leverage. Um, and this is by no means a, a comprehensive list. This is just a small sample of what's out there. There's a lot of nice tools, very mature tools with big communities around them. Uh, nice documentation and 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 um, and it's it's it makes your life easier basically. So the goal of our project is kind of like to have this convention and make it easier to others to execute. Um, and so we have to that end we have a, a small uh, popper I mean uh, common light tool um, and that we have developed. Um, this is just a small demo of what you would do. Uh, if you had to kind of like in, implement uh, or follow the convention for a paper, uh, you just uh, initialize it, you, assuming you're using Git, and then you initialize uh, your repository. And then at the beginning, you, well, the, it's empty, you just, have the, you just have the configuration file. But Popper allows you to kind of scaffold pipelines um, and and, and kind of like generates its files for you, that, that these files you would use uh, in order to automate the execution of your experiments. And also um, kind of like walks you through uh, what, it, what it is to uh, check the integrity of, of your pipelines. And the goal is for us basically to have automated, end-to-end -end automated experimentation pipelines so that if someone else comes and tries to replicate your results, it's easier for others to do it. Um, and also to continuously validate your results, you can also link to or, or, in, or, or apply continuous integration to your project. And we support Travis. Uh, this, this file allows you to basically register your GitHub project with Travis and then every time you make change to your pipeline, it will re-execute your entire pipeline and uh, tell you whether you were uh, successfully replicating results or not. Um, and that I can just to give you a high level view of, of that pipeline. This is what you what we kind of like ex the what we want to have at the end is a, an automated pipeline that uh, for a, a uh, commit whenever you do a change if you change a parameter to experiment it will trigger a re-execution um, it will um, uh, use any resources that you need validate the results just to check that you're actually generating the results you expect and then generate uh, a batch and and for this we have a batch server uh, that if you're familiar with batches on github this is basically the, what the three statuses we have um, and um, as part of our our um, our improvements, the things that we've done, we've as part of working with our mentor grant and um, and getting feedback from the domain experts that he has put us in contact with, we have made a lot of improvements to just documentation in general, just making things more digestible describing things easier in an easier way we created a specific milestone for this uh which was version the next version we're almost done with it um we've also um created uh what else yeah the documentation we this was another um another thing we did which was the demo i just did it's kind of recorded on the on the landing page of a project so you can quickly get a sense of what Popper is and 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 what um, what you can do with it. Um, we have also opened uh, some other issues that are not part of this milestone, but that we will work on that are 
uh, that came out of our conversation with the domain experts that uh, Grant put us in contact with. We also created a, a, a Twitter account and also, um, and we, I forget what else we did. Yeah, well, the contribution guidelines, uh, the um, roadmap and all those, all those things that are very useful and we've, we had a lot of insights by going through this experience. Um, I think that's, that's it. Um, thank you very much to all, um, Abby, Min, and Grant. This has been a very nice experience. Great, they're doing really good work. Uh, I really like the approach you're taking with uh, you know, automating, uh, I guess, under automated parts of research, uh, or you know, poorly automated even. Uh, great, you know, really, really good work. Thanks. Um, I think there's a comment from Abby. Uh, have you seen mybinder.org? Um, yes. Uh, I actually didn't go through an example. Um, uh, if I still have time, I can quickly just show you. Uh, so this is, a, for example, this is a paper we just submitted. And on the figure of a paper, we, we add a link. So if we, if we click on that link, that takes you to uh, the notebook. This is uh, an example of a popperized repo. Uh, and this has all the notebook and all the figures um, that are the same that appear on the, on the, on the, on the, um, on the paper. And we have links to uh, my, my binder in the, this, on this popperized repo. And also just instructions on how to, how to rerun experiments and how to rerun the analysis. Um, I love my binder. That's amazing. I'm glad you're using it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's really good. Yeah. Um, do you do you handle um, freezing dependencies by any chance? Uh, well, it depends on how do you implement your pipeline. In our mm. case, we just use Docker, mm. um, just to package. Uh, we make use of uh, um, NSF sponsored cl uh, clouds, which allow you to get access to resources uh, free of charge. So we have. Uh, you just request uh, nodes and you get like 10, 20, 30 machines all for yourself. Um, and then we use, we pull Docker containers and run them uh, there. Great work. Brilliant. Thanks. Um, and I think there's another comment saying, can't we, uh, wait to give this a try. Local CI uh, automa automation is tough, but useful. Even outside yeah. of research science. Cool. So um, we'll keep an eye out for any more questions. Uh, so next up we have, uh, open Data, Open Minds, uh, David Cole. Hi, everybody. Can you hear me? Yeah. Great. Um, I'd like to share my screen and see if I can go through some things that way and walk folks through things. My colleague, Elizabeth Silvan, is not with us today. She's got a gig she's doing at a school right now. But she was at MozFest, and so I'm going to try to do my best to represent what her experience was there. And there are a couple of ways I want to do that. Mm -hmm. um, let me pull up. A, let me see if I can share this screen here. Um, try that. Is that legible? Can, then, can you guys read that? This is sort of a vertical eight and a half just by 11 about. page. A little bit. Um, I'll just walk you through it. I guess the point of it is to see that there was a lot of stuff happening. Just to give you a sense of uh, who we are. Open Data, Open Minds is a project from NextMap. NextMap is a small nonprofit based in San Francisco. Open Data, Open Minds is a data literacy craft and code project that's working to create civic infrastructure around public, local, uh, municipal data feeds and teaching and learning communities. And um, this work that's represented in this timeline here sort of begins in May with Maker Faire in the Bay Area, also goes to June with the Global Sprint, and then Mozilla gets another shout out in October with MozFest, and then towards the end of our timeline here with Open Leaders. So our time in the last six months has really been characterized by the design for open um, method and ethos of uh, and the sort of Moz community model. And it's been hugely, hugely helpful for this, for us to be in this group, to work with Danielle and to think about the practices generally. Um, I wanted to share this screen to give you guys a sense of what we've been doing. We're by and large learning designers and educators. So all these different blocks on the screen here represent different engagements with people. Notre Dame University's uh, STEM certification program, Carnegie Mellon, Create Labs, conference on tech and data fluency for teaching and learning, Monterey Bay Aquarium, technology and conservation, um, as well as uh, some deep work this summer with a Pittsburgh Summer Institute. Um, 
and then the work with you all. So it's been really a wonderful project and a, it's, it continues to grow and develop. Um, to give you an, another picture of what it is we're doing and sort of pictures tell a thousand uh, words here, pictures worth a thousand words. This was a presentation I gave, I think, MozFest started on the 27th, is that right? Friday in October? Uh, yes, yeah, that sounds so, right. Sounds right. Yeah, so, the, so the day that Liz was, was with you all in London, I was in uh, Berkeley, California at the university um, doing this and, um, and it was sharing much of what she had on the gallery floor that evening. And so I wanted to just share it with the group as part of this demo section to give a picture of what it is we're doing. Um, this was for the School of Information, a bunch of um, policy people and coders who are thinking about the ethics of technology and policy for society. And it was a conversation about reaching out with grad students to help us do our work. Um, this is a quote we use that continues to inspire. We think about the competencies and the objectives of a teaching and learning experience, that network learning and a network uh, information is really uh, what we need to focus on as, as a new competency for kids and teachers. Um, and these pictures that follow kind of tell a story of what we're doing. So this is an example of some data literacy and design thinking work we did last summer uh, with the U.S. Patent and Trade Office. This is with 50 teachers at the University of Michigan. Um, here's an example of the format that we're thinking about. We're working with paper and electronics, so we really think that there are two platforms in a learning setting. Number one, there's a piece of paper or a notebook, which has thousands of years of fluency and rituals and routines. And on the other hand, there's a device, which is informed by about 40 years of syntax and rituals and routines that we think of with screens. And we think of paper as a very low cost way to onboard teachers and learners in the sort of early uh, 10 to 15 grade age range into some of the literacies that go with being tech savvy, thinking about open design, thinking about networks and thinking about systems thinking. Um, this is another picture of some of the things we've been doing. You see some handwork in the lower, lower left where kids are working with uh, familiar paper notebooks and, and uh, including stickable modules from our colleague and partner at the Media Lab, Chi Chi, who works with circuit stickers and we've been working with her from the start. In the upper left are some of the prototypes that were shared at MozFest. Kids in the upper right in Oakland and another prototype of our title notebook in the lower right. This is the Hack Your Notebook project. It's a kit that was sent up to Alaska where we've done work year over year over the past two summers. Um, this is a booklet series. You can see one of them called Program Your Pages here that focuses on a set of materials, LEDs, uh, pop-up, paper pop-up. Uh, the use of a microcontroller and a micro servo. It's a little suite of materials that creates a kind of library of thinking about materials and components in paper. And here's an example of the servo project. You can't see the servo, but it's behind there, and it's a kind of an automata project where the AT Tiny controls the movement of a paper design. So it introduces the fundamentals of robotics and craft, uh, along with some sophisticated but low cost ways to explore engineering. Um, when we think about who we're really targeting, this is a good example uh, for all the reasons you can imagine in terms of uh, the age range and the kids and the population served. Um, we're really looking at trying to support younger learners and their teachers in what the, are these fundamental literacies and skills. Um, we do a lot of workshops. We work with educators uh, around, the, around the country. We do a lot of outreach uh, with Twitter and with our web networks. Our community um, is growing through the Moz, Moz connections, but we also have built up a pretty sizable group on the Google Plus uh, website, which is something we started at the get-go about three years ago. Um, leadership is really another way to think of what we're all about. If we thought of our, of our customer or our key audience member, it really is an educator who's leading um, in and out of school. These two women are professors who train teachers. They reach literally hundreds of teachers a year uh, with practices of all kinds, and we're really proud to, to know that these two teachers have learned how to do this work and are taking it out into their practice. Uh, and I've been doing it for several years now. So the effects of this exchange are starting to be really be, um, quite profound. Um, our prototyping work continues with Jichi. This is a good example of the type of integration we're looking at with visual block programming languages. This is the make code, uh, a little screenshot of the make code interface um, that G and her partners at Chibitronics use to drive that board you're looking at in the foreground. That's called the Chibitronics Chibi chip. And it's a microcontroller with a use of flex PCB so that you can modulate outputs on paper with copper tape and you can clip it onto your notebook or onto your posters. This is a workshop we did this summer. Um, we've been spending a lot, lot of time prototyping uh, with a group in London 
And this is an example of some of the iteration around use cases we're doing to envision and model the way that kids would interact with communities, data, craft, and reflection. Um, some of the stuff has involved concept development. We're trying to get the form factor right so that we can create something that's low cost and durable and inspiring to work with. You can see our explorations with the clipping function um, and some of the builds on data boards on the left. Um, some of the board design and development we've been doing with the people in London at uh, uh, Somerset House and artists and engineers. And then the open data, open minds this is the first prototype we did. This is a little notebook that pulls information from the NOAA.gov website into a notebook. It registers the height of the tide north of the Golden Gate Bridge every time you turn on this IoT board from Particle. Um, and this is a polling on paper exercise where we use paper templates uh, for kids to design their own inquiry and create their own connected polling and data, data experience where you're able to use a simple input device for pushing binary data to a Google worksheet. Um, and the implications for working open and working on shareable files like this and moving from uh, paper to the web and back is, is uh, sort of at the center of what we're doing. Uh, last but not least is the city data dashboard that uh, Elizabeth took to, data to MozFest. There's a tweet of her in the lower right sharing it at the gallery in London. Um, and this is an important step for us too. This was a lot of work this, this fall to put this together uh, for MozFest and to make the case that we're really all about uh, building local communities around local uh, data sets. And uh, what we're up to going forward is blending live data and curated data this is the city of Austin in a pop-up. It, uh, it displays air quality, traffic circulation, temperature, time of day, and there's a local sensor that illuminates for the Congress Street Bridge. Those of you who know that, maybe from South by Southwest or from being in Texas generally, the bats live under that bridge and every evening at dusk they fly out of there. So when it's, um, it, when it's, um, it illuminates at nighttime. But the whole idea is to create a crafted display that teachers and kids can build that lets them explore and share information about their communities. And last but not least was a way of speaking to the audience at that School of Information, which is a way I think of speaking to the larger Moz community. Um, what we wanna be doing is to design these common data specs between cities. In this case, we're looking to do a project this summer between Oakland and Pittsburgh, uh, working out the interface and the back end for open web services that would let those specifications work between communities and then we can get that into an instructional design sequences so kids can explore those things uh, on paper. And that's, let me get out of my share here. And that's the overview. Um, and just by way of wrapping up, being able to think about this work in the context of the Moz community with open leaders has been really profound and very inspiring. Um, the whole premise of an open leaders model designing for open is at the center of what we're doing where we've got all kinds of things to get over and we're making good progress with how to deal with the tangible interface of paper and the very fluid functionality of the api calls and the logic you need to define data specs so you can take an aq spec from oakland to pittsburgh elsewhere and have kids do a common project our theory is that once we design this well for one community we can share it with any community that has access to those sensor networks or that information and it's something that can move forward and I guess by way of, you know, one thing that this, this uh, time with you guys has really helped clarify in our minds is the idea of civic infrastructure. Uh, we think of that as something that gets built up for communities at large, but um, it's been really, really helpful to think of civic infrastructure as something that can be available for teachers and learners in their communities. What we'd like to do is use this project to connect school districts with city governments and use this as a way to um, engage both communities and deliver some value to each. So that's what we've been doing. Big shout out to Danielle Robinson up in Portland, who was our mentor. She was just great. As she said, she was sort of a project therapy coach, which was exactly what she was. Um, our big challenges going forward are really fundraising to get ourselves to a place where we can do the deep design to, to package what we're up to. But this period of time with Moz Open Leaders has been really um, a huge lift for us because we've pushed the prototypes pretty far. Um, Elizabeth made great connections at MozFest with a bunch of you all, several of you on the call now, she was really pleased to meet in person. And we're really eager to follow up. So it's been great and we've really enjoyed it. So thanks very much. Thanks, David, it's great work. I think you have um, a question, 326. Yeah. Let, me, let me see if I can get down and get to that. Cool. Uh, da, 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 haven't explored you. Da, da, da. G Plus does not work all that well for us. We're migrating to Facebook, um, which seems to be what everyone's doing. Um, G plus is okay. It's a great, we've got a good list there, but you know, these, as you know, these um, communities are all about how, how active you are on it. 
Um, but we do have a good collection there. It's a great place to post to. Um, there's a, it's a really good repository for seeing some examples of what a really what some dedicated community members have done. So we continue to use it, but going forward, we're going to increasingly be working in Facebook for all the reasons you can imagine. Um, great. Yeah, someone's got, oh yeah, iBeam, Chibitronics are really great. I have to say, one of the things that's been fabulous, we reached out to Chi, the founder of Chibitronics, in November, you know, in September of 2013, four years ago, she was just launching it, and Chi, and we he called her up and said, could we do electronics and storytelling? And she said, yes. And so we've been a partner and a collaborator with her since the get-go. And it's been hugely powerful. The form factor that she's working with and the premise is really, really great. So it's fun to think of you guys working with them. They're great. It's really been wonderful. Thanks, Thanks again. Thank you. It's really, this really, uh, really cool. I want to maybe, you know, get my hands on it. And yeah, try we'd love to. That'd be, that'd be really good, yeah. And the last thing I can say, one last request and shout out, I mentioned it in my notes. Um, you saw the Hack Your Notebook series in one of my slides, those little booklets. Um, we're going to be doing a Kickstarter starting in January to get those things printed. Mm -hmm. And it's really a lead into the Open Data, Open Minds work, moving that stuff from sort of analog craft to connected literacy and craft. So um, we'll be sharing that out with you all and would love a reshare on whatever you can do with your network. So um, watch for that. Thanks again. Great. Cool. Make sure you uh, tag, it, uh, tag it with Moz Open Leaders on Twitter. Yeah. And I think Abby will retweet. Will do. Great. Thanks again. Thanks, David. So next up, we have iBeam Education with Lauren. Hi. I'm a little Hi, sick, Lauren. so my voice might be weird. But um, thank you so much for this. And I'm so glad to be at this point where I can share with you um, what our initial goal was. If you guys can click the link that is um, the GitHub link that's underneath there, You'll actually see, so our goal was really kind of twofold. The first one was to come up with a format. We work with about 16 teachers each summer who teach different classes. And um, they, they prepare all their materials in a, in a way that's like unique to them. Um, and what's been uh, frustrating for us is that they're all such great classes. <laughs> we want to be able to document them and share them. And then also be able to look back at them and um, advocate their work, their knowledge, uh, all the effort they've done, and possibly offer those classes again as professional development with those teachers, but to a wider audience. But without any sort of documentation, it's been really hard for us to be able to advocate for these teaching artists. So <laughs> the goal was for us to come up with a template Right. And, uh, and if, if you look on our iBeam GitHub, you'll see like what we've put together for digital day camp before, but it was very small in comparison. So a larger template that describes the curriculum, the class, the goals of the learning, who Hey, Lauren. Did we lose Lauren? Maybe. Oh, no. Oh, no. Can you hear me? Oh, there you're back now. Hi. Oh, no. Okay. Yeah, I just got this little message that said that my internet connection is unstable. Oh. <laughs> it it's happens. Very, yeah, it's very judgy, though. That seems kind of mean. Um, I think he's fine. So, anyway, we wanted to come up with a format that would be easy to use and then also a little bit more in depth um, so that we could gather all this really great information. So first we created a template and we put it under IBM curriculum. And then the second thing we did is we went back to one of our favorite classes from digital day camp this summer, which was called understanding the internet. And we want, our goal was really to get the first part of understanding the internet up on the GitHub uh, using the template. And so that's what we're looking at, which is great. So this class was three parts. And this was the first of the three. Uh, and I'll be working on the other two. This one is really a sort of understanding the internet. The second one is called seeing the internet. And the third one is called breaking the internet. In seeing the internet, what we did was we walked around and did some Wi-Fi sniffing. And then we also showed them how to do packet sniffing. And then the third part was threat modeling and cracking Wi-Fi passwords with the router that we set up. We didn't have them crack anyone else's passwords because we told them that was illegal. And so anyway, I, I just wanted to say that because I know this is being recorded. 
So, um, uh, so anyway, but it's very important to understand the internet to, to kind of know how to break the internet and know how to protect yourself. And, and, uh, and that was a really great way for us to be able to do that. So, um, so the first one, uh, where we're at right now is that it's online, but I do have to go back. And um, one of the things that's been really great about this process is really stopping and focusing before you publish something and saying, who is my audience? Who am I making this for? I'm not just making it for myself. I want to make this so that it has a, a longer lifespan. Um, so everything that was made is like a, a PDF. Um, we're going back and then we're going to put it on Google Docs and like just open it up, uh, which is, which will be really great. And then teachers will be able to go in and copy that and like, you know, uh, yeah, and create their own Google Docs and, and just change them however they want. So that'll be nice. So we still have a little bit of tweaking to do. Um, and then, and then this one will be completely done. The, uh, and then we'll work on the other two as well. <laughs> but the thing that was kind of amazing about all this is that during this process, um, we realized that there were other teachers even around the New York City area who were working on similar curriculum, which was actually just understanding the internet. Um, you know, I think if I'm, I'm old, er, and I, I think that I, I didn't realize that, you know, the process of seeing the internet kind of grow up has given me the ability to demystify a lot of, of technical concepts. And in talking to teachers now, like they say, gosh, it's, it's hard. I even have to explain the difference between digital and analog. Like they don't have any even concept of like what analog is, or there's just things that kind of blow their minds. Because if you think about it, the cell phone that we have in our pocket has more power and computing power than the entirety of Bell Labs, right? When it created the computer and the concepts for the internet, the entire Bell Labs. So it's, it's a little mind numbing to think that, um, that we have to go back and explain how these things work um, in order to get them to get kids to kind of like move forward and understand more challenging concepts, but it's really important. So that's basically what this exercise does. And what I'm looking for is feedback from anyone really. And if you're not a teacher, that's fine because the thing that's really cool too, and I put this link in here for you guys, there's all these additional resources at the bottom, but my favorite one, I put it in the GitHub and I also put it in the um, hack pad is there's this guy named David J. Farber, and he actually worked at Bell Labs. He's the one who told me that quote, and he gave a talk last week um, for CS teachers about the history of the internet, and it was like all his perspective as he was working on creating the internet. Like, he's one of those guys. So, so if you've got 45 minutes of your life, yeah, exactly, totally bookmark this and watch it. It's amazing, and he also, he worked on the FCC and he sort of talks about like where we're at right now, but how important it is um, that we teach kids the history of this um, because the one thing that he stresses and it's kind of my takeaway and maybe this is something that will inspire you guys too, is that it was just an experiment. <laughs> like it was, there were no super huge grand designs. It wasn't made, you know, for commerce. It wasn't made like he even has these funny notes from some of his bosses where it was like, well, we can, we can, you know, make uh, the data rates faster. And they were like, oh no, no one's going to want to like share data on this thing, whatever, you know? So I think, <laughs> I think it's kind of funny to, to have those, um, uh, those little snippets and pass those on to other teachers. But so what I'm looking for from you guys and from anybody from the community is uh, it's important to us to be able to teach this in a way that doesn't require a lot of tools um, or is very accessible. So to, to be able to pass on the vocabulary and the concepts, be able to demystify a lot of this stuff. Um, uh, so if you guys have any sort of confusion over what I've written up or think it's unaccessible, definitely just let me know. Um, also, if there's anything that you feel like you would like to understand more, um, any concepts that you would be interested in seeing curriculum developed around or explained, let me know because I, I kind of think that um, now that I've got this online, the thing that's been amazing in connecting with these people is it's just I can see how this 
can grow, I see how, how having something like this on GitHub would just be so easy for us all to expand on um, and share. So absolutely, let me know what you think. Uh, I've got the, what are those called? Uh, issues <laughs> and milestones. Um, so feel free to either contribute there or to hit me up over email. I've got my email in there. And, um, and definitely let me know what you think. And I'll get the other two online soon. And even if you're just a nerd and you want to know about the history of the internet, uh, go through the additional resources at the bottom and, uh, and let me know if you have any other questions or feedback. And thank you so much. This has been um, uh, a huge blessing just to be able to meet once a week with both the mentor and uh, everybody here in this group and just see everyone move their projects forward. So thank you for the help and the inspiration and the motivation. Thanks, Lauren. You're working on really good stuff. Um, I'm going to definitely bookmark that video to take a look uh, later. Uh, I think Abby offered to help on the uh, pages version of the exercises. Yeah, I do that lots. Yeah, lots, yeah. Of, lots of Jekyll pages, which is brilliant. We should probably move to our last person since we're over time. Yeah, definitely. Cool. So let's uh, sort of... Yeah, we'll follow up later. Cool. So uh, next project is Nighty Night. Uh, here we are. Would you mind doing the last uh, project of this call? Is Uriel on the call? He is. You're unmuted, but we can't hear you, Uriel. Yeah. I see Luis is also here. Maybe hmm. can Luis present? Hello, everyone. Can you hear Hey, me? yes, we can hear you, Luis. We can hear you. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, let me see if my video is working. Oh, no, we don't want to record. Don't want to record. Okay. Um, hello, everyone. I want to. I would like to share my. How do you share your? Um, there is a green button at the bottom. Ah, I see. Yeah. Um, Sorry, Oreo. Luis okay. will take this over. Awesome. Um, hello everyone, uh, I'm Luis, um, and along with Riel, we have this project called Light in the Night. Our goal is to raise awareness of Firefox Nightly, that's the version of Firefox that is compiled every night, and have more people using and reported books on this version. Um, the idea behind this project is to, is because that is one of the most critical parts of uh, in the whole Firefox, um, in, in the whole Firefox use, and not so many people are using Firefox, uh, Firefox Nightly, and not so many people who speak Spanish are using Firefox Nightly. So, our idea is to have, I to open our idea is to have uh, these short videos about Firefox Nightly. Um, and how you, how you can install it, how you can use along with your Firefox, uh, with other version of Firefox, and how you can contribute. Um, but by today, we, we record one video. Uh, it was, it's really hard right, to make a script and like, to record a video, um, a short video about the importance. Uh, we record a video about the what is Nightly uh, and why it's important for people who, oh, why it's important of, why is important? Um, why is important to use Nightly? Um, we have this uh, repository, but we but we are creating issues about the next video we want to share. Uh, we are currently working on how you can install Firefox Nightly on Windows 10 and Mac OS, and how you can have uh, two um, Firefox um, versions in your same computer. Um, if you want to help, and uh, if you happen to speak Spanish, you can help us reviewing the scripts. Uh, and if you have another idea about which topic we should uh, raise or talk in the videos, uh, we'd be really happy to receive your issues on the on, on, on GitHub. Um, that's all. Um, about the, uh, we want to thank very, very much to Julian, our mentor, to help. He helped us a lot about in the process of understanding how to make um, an achievable goal, how we can have um, different, uh, how we can experiment uh, with different versions of the video. Um, this first video takes us forever to record, uh, to get onto this final form. 
because our first uh, draft, it was about 10 minutes, the video. Uh, so after we discuss and have some, some tests with the local um, Unix, uh, Linux user group, uh, we start like um, having a more shorter and shorter and shorter video until we have this final version. Um, the, the video, the link is on the Etherpad, uh, so if you have to speak Spanish, um, we want, we really want your help. Um, at the end, we want to thank the um, Open Leadership uh, Forum. Um, it was a really, really cool experience. Um, it's silent, use nightly. It will it help you are helping the web to continue open and to continue open and safe for everyone. So thank you very much. And I, that's our um, that's our demo. Great. Thanks. So it's, you know, it's really good to have you know, targeted, focused uh, um, efforts on the collaboration in the Spanish-speaking communities for, for Nightly. That's great work. Brilliant work. Thank um, you. Uh, I think I have. I saw, I saw the question about if you were finding more interested after the quantum launch. Yes. Um, <laughs> yes. The, the answer. The short answer is yes. Uh, we, we receive. Uh, we receive a really good feedback about our first video. Um, and people get more interested and help us like, hey, we should, we should, you should talk about this or that. Or you know that in, if we're using the surviving system, it's really difficult to uh, do this or do that. You should raise this uh, on your videos. So definitely we, we get a lot more attention after um, quantum launch. Great and I, I don't know if Uriel wants to add something or, or if it's here in the, in the, in the call. Mm -hmm. Weird. And I think we still can't hear him. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah, but we should probably end the call. I'm sorry, because yeah, we're a bit over. I was a bit over too time, ambitious. Yeah. I, yeah. Said, yeah. I thought we could do this leisurely, but <laughs> Turn, turns out not. Right? <laughs> cool. So I guess because we're running out of time, we'll quickly wrap up and uh, I guess skip over this next section very, very, very quickly. So if you want to participate and, um, and volunteer, get involved with more stuff. Um, Please leave a name on uh, line 380 onwards, and maybe you know write uh, write down what you want to get involved in, what you're interested in. That's really appreciated. And uh, just because I said so at the beginning, I'm gonna quickly go back up. Uh, Friends of Mozilla again, so because I think that's changed. So, uh, quick shout out to Grant, um, great mentor, Julian, uh, Danielle Robinson. Uh, cool. So sorry, I had to like speed you know, rush through this, <laughs> but yeah. Great work, everyone. Um, it looks like this is this is uh, the end of the uh, of the call. Um, sorry for taking uh, seven minutes additional time. I'll be yeah. uploading the call, so I know a few people have to drop off, but you'll be mm -hmm. able to catch the recording. Mm -hmm. And yeah, great. And um, there are probably more questions in the uh, in the Etherpad, but this Etherpad is public and visible, so you can always come back to this link and and uh, follow up from there. Yeah. Uh, Even cool. if you're watching the recording, feel free to add your questions there. We'll be around. Great. So uh, let's wrap this up. <laughs> All right, then. All right. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thanks. Bye. Thanks.